how do they know that they're being bullied? Well, dear bully target, you're the last to know. That's, first of all, I want you to know that you're the one who doesn't know. You are unaware. Your family knows. They've seen the change in you. Dr. Gary Namey, he's a psychologist, or he's a social psychologist, an academic, a researcher, he's been consulting for years. I uh, had the privilege of meeting him some years ago. Gary Namey is a social psychologist, widely regarded as North America's foremost authority on workplace bullying. He has extensive experience teaching in graduate management and psychology departments. Are there demographics on, you know, what the typical bully is? Is it more male, is it more female? Yeah. Um, tell me about that. First of all, the perpetrators on the perp side, it's, it's two thirds male, third mm -hmm. female. Mm -hmm. So what are common traits that workplace bullies have? There are two piles of explanations, two categories. Those about which we can do something mm -hmm. and those about which we are totally helpless to stop. Now I hear a lot about bullying in children's schools right elementary school middle school high school but i don't really hear much about workplace bullying or at least people really talking about it so how bad is it you know how it's bad so is funny. workplace bullying? you know that that's why we dubbed it the silent epidemic all those years ago mm -hmm. it is so prevalent it'll just blow your socks off and we know this because um not because of any website surveys that we do but we commission and um national surveys mm -hmm. national scientific surveys what makes them scientific is zogby the political pollster gives us national samples representative samples of adult americans that i don't mm -hmm. have access to and we've done five of them to date uh the last one was 2021 and 30 percent. okay this is this is the epidemic part 30 percent of adult Americans have been directly bullied by our definition, which I can give you. Hmm. And that translates to over 30 million Americans, I forget now, 40 some million Americans. When wow. you add the people who have witnessed it, you've got like 49% of adult Americans have been touched by this. But like you said, there's no talking. It's a silent epidemic. So it's our dirty little, it's business, it's dirty little secret. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. yeah, it's been, uh, it, it's just, it's an amazing, undiscussable topic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's dive deeper into that. Um, it's a silent epidemic. 30% of people have been um, bullied themselves in the workplace. So why? Is it so prevalent but not talked about? You know, is it because people are feeling a little bit like they would be embarrassed? Shame. You know, they step no, out. You're onto it. Yeah. You're onto it. What keeps it? What keeps people quiet is the personal shame. They're mm. you're not gonna go running home from work that day and just say, "Hey, I've been humiliated uh, mm. and, and threatened," and God, I feel good about it. You withdraw cocoon-like retreat and you demony there goes my singing contract <laughs> i'll get <laughs> we can get i could out. have been the next sinatra okay mm -hmm. but what what you <clears throat> you retreat because of personal shame now the organizations have i think employers have some shame too mm -hmm. but basically they're ashamed they've been supporting the abusers on their payroll and they don't want to talk about it. That exposes them to liability. Mm -hmm. But then that touches another topic. It's entirely legal in the U.S. Now, mm -hmm. I know you got a worldwide audience, and it would stun a lot of people in other countries to know the U.S. is so far behind in addressing this. In fact, we're the last of the Western industrialized nations not to have a law about, on it. Not for lack of trying. That was for years, about a third of my life is trying to get legislation passed. But I tell you, the the bill, so, the law sausage making operation in the states wore me down. Mm. Um, it's no longer a big part of my life. We have bills that are still active out there, but I I can't wait on politicians to get with the program. That's mm. they're just they're the last to come along. But 
<clears throat> yeah, we're not discussing it because of the impact on individuals' lives and the fact organizations uh, are incentivized to cover it up. Mm, I see. So I've read that you serve as an expert witness in many you know, bullying-related um, legal cases. So what's like the worst case you've ever seen? Worst. There's some competition for that one, let me tell you. For, first of all, let me say, everybody thinks they're going to sue. Everybody thinks, ah, there's got to be a law against this. And I told you it's legal, okay? So I don't actually testify much about bullying per se, but abusive conduct in the in the context of a toxic workplace, okay? Mm -hmm. And that that's a much more widely applicable term. Because toxic workplace encompasses the illegal harassments and the rest. But the worst, the worst. So to survive, to make it to court, a plaintiff who is the, the underdog, the employee, who files a lawsuit against their employer and the abusive bosses that the employer has propped up, has to jump so many hoops to have their case even survive to get close to trial. People don't know this, that as soon as you file a lawsuit, the very first thing the other side gets to do is depose you. You're, you're the good guy, the good gal, the good person, the, the harmed person, and you want relief and you want, it's a civil case, it's not criminal. So you need money to be made whole for your losses somehow. You want to get in front of a jury that can hear what was done to you. You want justice. That's a big thing. Bully targets want justice. Is they're outraged by the injustice of it all. Why them? And our research shows, and like I've talked to over 12,000 of these people myself over the years, that we used to have a toll-free hotline and all that. So I know intimately the target experience. And they want their justice <clears throat> Because they did nothing wrong, but the reason they were targeted, Fung, is because they were the superior employee. They were the better person. They were the skilled one. Because that threatened that jerk of a boss, and it's still 60 some, 65%, it's still bosses, okay? Although it comes from coworkers and from people below in the org chart, it comes from all directions, but it's primarily still the bosses. Mm. Um, that boss is threatened. They can't stand the fact that you're so good at what you do. And so isn't that the paradox of it? Mm -hmm. Or your reward, your reward for being so good is you're going to get pummeled. All right. Mm -hmm. So people want that reversed. And my gosh, they, it's hard to find an attorney. First of all, bullying is not illegal. So you better have a hook. You mm -hmm. better have uh, a sexual harassment hook a racial discrimination hook, uh, better be age-related hook, mm. a disability-related. You got to have something that the narrow laws cover, okay? Mm. Um, and so you file. And the very first thing that happens is the other side, the employer's attorneys, and they hire corporate defense attorneys who come in, and they get to depose you. And de depositions are like intellectual rape. They mm. are where you thought you were humiliated originally in your bullying and your harassment. You ain't been through nothing until those attorneys get a hold of you. And they, you'll, they'll have you thinking you're crazy. That's the goal. That you've imagined everything, every accusation you've put forth is a lie, da 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 da, da. Mm. So that you, but let's say you survive that. And often they'll do, two, three, four days of depositions to beat you down. They're trying to convince you, drop your damn lawsuit. But you hold on. A few, many do drop out. And you hold on. Then they file motions for what are called summary judgment or dismissal. They're asking the judge, throw it out. There's no merit to what's going on here. This person's making this crap up. And I can't tell you how many get thrown out. Mm -hmm. So now you're basically you're down to like 1% of the cases that are filed will actually go to trial. And then the, even then that takes years. 
Mm -hmm. because now you have to get calendared and COVID came in and messed up all the court calendars. And so everybody has this massive time shift and the years roll by. So you're not going to get any immediate justice. So now you get to a trial and now maybe you get an attorney who's actually your true advocate because most attorneys, the goal is to settle. Civil cases are about money. So it's like, just take the money and shut up. Mm -hmm. And and give me my 40% cut because that's what attorneys get. Mm -hmm. And so it's so hard to get to trial. However, having said that, that's the long preamble to my favorite instances of justice are as follows. There was a very sweet man who worked for the state of California, state agency, for years and years and years. He had a 20-year uh, career 20 plus year career more than 20 at the time and here's the thing he was totally happy he was a man who had tremendous chemical sensitivity so that meant he was allergic he had strong allergic anaphylactic shock type reactions to certain chemicals regular mm -hmm. cleaning compounds windex was one that i remember mm -hmm. i don't remember the others but you know if they were, if that custodial people were just using normal, those chemicals, he would be, have to go to the emergency room. He'd be, they'd call an ambulance. He couldn't breathe. And as he'd seize up and his lungs would be closing and he could die. Um, but he had an agreement with his boss for 20 years that he would pick the chemicals and he picked the chemicals and he and everyone got along marvelously. But as what happens in all bullying situations, in comes a new boss mm. out of the blue from the outside, a woman in this case, who just said, the hell with that. I like Windex. And she ordered the custodial people to use all the chemicals that hurt him. So he started having episodes. Then she, she took a program analyst with 20 years deep experience in technical things and what he had done and put him in reception the front desk where the public comes in and, and seated next to him, a friend of hers. Mm. So she's a plant. And what she did was perfume bomb him. Whenever he'd go to the re restroom, he'd come back. She perfume bomb him. Oh, my goodness. 24 trips to the emergency room. 24 stinking trips to the emergency room. Ambulance, full-blown, life-threatening crap. But he prevailed he got he went through all those hoops that i told you about legally got to a trial got to a jury i got to testify uh on his behalf about how what his boss did was nothing related to work and then everything about character assassination assaults on his dignity and just wanting to control him you see bullying is like domestic violence it, if you understand intimate partner violence, domestic violence, abusive relationships among people, you understand bullying because that's that's hit the abusers on the payroll. And that's what she was. And I got to tell the jury that. And he got three million, took him, I don't know, four or five years till the oh state paid up, but they did pay up. Mm. That was the biggest to me. It was, you see, it's nothing physical, but look at the harm that it caused him in his health. Because mm -hmm. we define bullying as repeated health harming mistreatment by one or more people um, of an employee. It's abusive conduct that takes the form of verbal abuse or threats, intimidation, humiliation, or workplace interference and sabotage or some mm -hmm. combination. And they were, that was all of it. He, mm -hmm. his case captured all of it. It sounds subtle. You could say, oh my gosh, so what's the big deal, whether it's Windex or not? It's the difference between life and death for that man. Mm -hmm. Here's right. my point. That organization had made peace with that. His prior manager said, whatever you need, I'm here to, I don't want to, I don't want the mm -hmm. work to kill you. Right. We love the work you do for us. But that's the point that in came the new woman who said, the heck with that. I'm all about control and I'm going to dominate him. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was a dominatrix. There's no doubt about it. 
I'll just say that was the sweetest of all because of the man's character. Right. He, uh, again, kind soul. I find that targeted people over the years, and I've been doing this so long, are the salt of the earth. They're the best people. How can you hate them? Well, you just there are a subset of people among us who despise people who are better than us, and they can't handle that. And their response is, oh, teach me. Can you teach me about the job? Can you teach me how do you deal with the public like that? You're so skilled. Instead, it's, I got to take you down because you mm -hmm. make me look bad. Right. And that's that's what we're in. It's a zero sum world, not unlike our current political climate. Mm -hmm. Wow, that that's such an awful sort of scenario. So yeah, yeah. Let's let's kind of unpack that. Did he reach out to her superiors? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You mm -hmm. always um as we've always coached people. Now I didn't know him prior to the trial, mm -hmm. but he was familiar with our work. So he had read also that you need to go up the ladder, up and around. You got to circumvent these people. The only way to cow them into um, retreat is power. They, they only speak the language of power because mm -hmm. they're abusing power. They only use it to their advantage. They're what we call Machiavellian, right? Mm -hmm. They're the ones who use other people, exploit other people for personal gain. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, they, but they respond to power above them, telling them, hey, knock it off. Yeah. So he tried. But the regional people were as fearful of that local manager. Here's the thing. Mm. They're all afraid of the bully. Mm. And they cow to the bully. And they let the bully basically bully other people with impunity. Mm. That's why there's so little accountability. And all the while, don't you see... The targeted person who is silently supported by the co-workers, but the co-workers are petrified. And there, there's a whole, well, we've written books about this. But the point is, they're, and I'm, a, I'm a social psychologist. And I can tell you from the group behavior and everything we know about bystander effect, uh, the more people who witness your misery, the less likely uh, that somebody's going to jump in and help. Mm -hmm. It's just not the nature of the beast, the phenomenon. The, yeah, the beast. It brings out the beast and all of it. So um, he wore, he went around and hoped that the higher ups would crush his woman uh, uh, bully, but they did not. Mm -hmm. They were petrified, and she stayed oh. on. I don't think she's there anymore. The case is now we're we're probably ten years past that case, mm -hmm. but he has remained a, a friend uh, to me. And uh, well, I love everybody that I get to testify on behalf of because mm. they're they've gone through so much. And then I got other nurses stories out of healthcare because, look, the two though he was in government, the two industries where this is most prevalent are education. And you mentioned it in the K through 12. You got it with the kids, mm -hmm. but you got teachers being pummeled mm. in the schools, too. So wow. often teachers are not so sympathetic to the kids being bullied because they're they're getting their own dose. Mm. Um, mm. But in higher ed, like in my academic life, prior life, um, there's a lot of bullying in higher ed. And the second industry is healthcare. And right. healthcare, it's just, it's endemic. It, it's almost defining. And you go, and I just had a, like, an emergency surgery thing happened, a medical thing happened, and thank God it got resolved and all that. But here I am knowing how many of you guys are getting bullied while you're still trying to treat me. Mm. And I, I hope it doesn't distract you because I kind of, my body needs your attention for my health sake. But if we thought about it that way, we would be, as a public, we would, um, we would just be intolerant of the mm. bullying that happens in healthcare. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to find out how bullying in the healthcare space is affecting the performance of the people doing surgeries, you know, taking care well, of I'll patients. Give you, I'll give you an example. Um, mm -hmm. A very first client, first of all, you're right that it impacts patient care. Mm -hmm. And that is the bottom line in healthcare if, you, if you're a healthcare professional worth your salt at all. If you give a damn, 
you care about patient care, right? Mm -hmm. okay. That's why you're there. All right. But not for the political power players. They're there for gamesmanship on mm -hmm. every day. The very first hospital that brought us in on a consulting gig that always has to remain unnamed because of confidentiality mm -hmm. had nurse problems inside the operating room. Wow. There were power games happening during surgeries. This is this is the scary part you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's not hypothetical. It actually mm -hmm. happened. Uh, and happens clearly. If it happened there, it's it's in a million other places. But you'd have the senior nurse who is called a preceptor in the room, the surgical suite, and she's supposed to be teaching the newest nurse who's becoming a surgical assistant nurse to a surgeon. And so you got the veteran supposedly there to mentor, coach, assist, aid, teach, do whatever you got to do in a supportive role because that's what teaching is. But instead, what was reported to us is certain preceptors would sit in the room, sit, first of all, sit. Why are you sitting? Uh, arms crossed, refusing to help the newbie as the newbie struggled with a patient, an anesthetized patient lying there on the table and the surgeons doing their work. So yes, people died, we were told. Patients were compromised, we were wow. told. And yeah. And all because of someone's petty need. The, the, mm -hmm. One of the most brilliant phrases I ever heard for bully as a synonym was petty tyrant. There was an old, old academic paper called, uh, I don't know, The Wrath of Petty Tyrants. Petty. Just look at, think of that word. How small of a human being can you be? Are you kidding? Someone's life is literally on that table. And they're helpless. They're anesthetized. They can't do anything to save themselves. They need you to make them better. And you're playing political games, organizational games for your own benefit. Yeah. To unconscionable. Wow. And that then you've got terrible. doctors thumping nurses too. Nurses have their own phrase for this, Fong. They call hmm. it lateral or horizontal violence. Wow. Unfor and that captures perfectly that scenario I just talked to you about because it was nurse on nurse. What mm -hmm. lateral doesn't allow for is physician to nurse, right? administrator to nurse. Everybody beats up nurses. And mm -hmm. who do we, who's motivated to help and heal more than anybody than a nurse? Right. Nurses get into it for the right reasons, into that profession. You don't get into that profession if you don't have a very deep, compassionate heart and you want to heal. Mm -hmm. People don't get into school teaching, and I mean K through 12 more than university. Uh, yes, I love teaching, but I don't know if I got into it for the development of young people. That became a big part of the job that I love, but I love the teaching part. Mm -hmm. But K through 12, you are not, you're getting in there to develop little human beings right. and help them grow in that. And so therefore, school teachers and nurses are the most bullied professions uh, in the country because their focus is on what we call pro-social behavior, right? right? Helping, healing, developing. The famous thing where the school teacher sees, oh, no, that's not a pile of manure. There's, in there is a pony somewhere. Mm -hmm. There's, they always see hope in dismal situations. And you take a person with that perspective and that optimism, and then you beat them up and you control them and you whip them down and the rest, and you denigrate them, you're hurting the best of the best of the people in our society, nurses and mm -hmm. teachers. So I'll always go down swinging on their behalf, at least yeah. the good ones. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And do you think maybe because they're so goodwill, right? They're, they're focused on helping the world. Maybe they have a softer heart, right? Um, maybe they're a little bit more understanding, empathetic, empathetic patient. And so they're easier targets for bullies. Do you think that might be why the In industry is? Yes. Mm -hmm. Long answer, yes. Because they are, they're so focused. Look at where the focus is. Mm -hmm. the focus is over here on the job. Right. They say, I just want to be left alone. All targets say, I just want to be left alone to do my job. This opens up one's backside to attack. Mm -hmm. 
to shivs being stuck in and everything else. So they are apolitical. What we know about targets in general are the top attribute is they're actually quite independent. They refuse to be subservient, which gets them into trouble because then they're considered uppity and they mm -hmm. resist efforts to control. Second, they're technically more skilled, hence the threat. They're emotionally intelligent. They're well-liked by everybody. And people who are cruel are not well-liked by everybody, so therefore there's another resentment. They are honest and ethical, which creepy criminal-like people cannot stand, mm -hmm. people who undermine others. And the last of the attributes, positive attributes, is they're apolitical. Mm -hmm. They don't they don't think of work the workplace as a forum for playing games. Now, if I were HR, and HR is a funny function in companies, they're kind of feckless and worthless, but as we've learned over the years, and I they're good people, but they don't ever have the authority to fix this problem. So until they do, don't talk to me. But if I were an HR quote, professional, whatever that means, I would go and I would, um, I'd want to hire these targets because they're self-starting, technically skilled, honest, mm -hmm. emotionally intelligent team players. Right. But the one attribute they have is an inability, and you're hinting at this, an inability to defend themselves when attacked. Mm. Now, what... They'll think of things to say later on a comeback an hour or two later uh, or a day or two. They're not stupid, but in the moment, they don't have the verbal repertoire, the verbal repartee. They don't, mm -hmm. they're not snarky. Right. They're too damn nice. Yeah. And they, and they don't think counterattack. They think, oh my gosh, that lie that was said about me. Hmm. If it's true, could there be a kernel of truth to it? And they begin that what non-targets don't do. They begin to blame themselves. Non-targets, bully-proof people, which is still like 70% of the population, are the kinds of people to say, uh, wait a minute, what did you just say? You're saying, no, 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 no. You're not hmm. talking to me because you don't have enough spare tires to drive out of that parking lot today. Mm -hmm. If I go and uh, slice all your tires. So you just need to back up right now and apologize and do it. And bullies will back down with that aggressive counter response. Mm -hmm. And that be, that's a, a basis for a Bud Light commercial. Um, mm -hmm. I love you, man. The old, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, but there was, there was a commercial uh, that they ran for years. I love you, man. Bonding, male bonding thing. Mm -hmm. Making fun of male bonding. Well, that's bonding with the aggressor. The aggressors mm. like aggression. And they say, I respect you. Now, part of my work has taken me to dealing with high-level a-holes in uh, the academe, like high-level, multi-grant-funded researchers, judges, uh, physicians. Uh, when the companies finally, the employer says, you know, enough is enough. Go, go try and talk to them, work with them, try and humanize them. We're not going to mm. fire them for God's sakes, but see what you can do. So I'm mm. the alternative to anger management. It's called, uh, we do a thing called respectful conduct clinic or mm. bully boot camp. But the truth is when you deal with the bullies themselves, they say the darndest things. Well, why did you do that? I don't know. She made me do it. No, mm. no, no, no. You are in control of your own behavior. For God's sakes, be responsible, be accountable. Well, mm. but I didn't want to do it, but she made me. All right, enough for this. She made me do it. Right. What else? Well, I was just doing what management, this is my definition of management. This is what management is, isn't it? And furthermore, I've been getting away with it for 15 years. Why would I change now? If the employer wanted it done differently, they would have told me. No, they're afraid of you. So see, all of these cockamamie rationalizations that bullies engage in are, are what sustains this. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a quite complex phenomenon, really. Oh, yeah. So when I think of teachers and nurses, yeah. I think of a very female-dominated 
field, right? Fields. Yeah, unfortunately, so yes. Is are there demographics on you know what the typical bully is? Is it more male? Is it more female? Yeah. Um, tell me about that. We have that from our national surveys. Uh, first of all, the perpetrators on the perp side, it's it's two thirds male, third mm -hmm. female. Mm -hmm. It's so funny when we wrote our first book. Where do I have it? I do. I have the very first book we wrote because Oprah called. So we had to hurry up and have a book. Uh, Bullyproof Yourself at Work. Notice the cartooning that we had drawn from this Vermont um, uh, caricaturist. And we just found him again, and he drew us a whole new set in 2021. But anyway, um, when we first started our work and we took telephone calls from people, they were all women. And they all had women bullies. So we thought it was really a woman-on-woman -woman phenomenon, right? Until many years later, we did our first, na it was 10 years before we did our first national study. And then we came to learn, it's not a woman on woman even close. But here's what we know. When the perp, the bully is a man, he is more, demo they are, men are more, demo um, they're more fair in the balance. They torment, um, Slightly more females than males, slightly more. But the minority perpetrator population, women, if you are unfortunate enough to have a woman bully and you are a woman, you're going to have between 65 and 80% chance of being bullied because women bully women disproportionately. So mm. they don't go after men as much. And so we've mm. had to, you know, pause at all kinds of reasons for that. But why, why do you isn't it is? interesting that the, the majority group of all the four combinations mm. of male and female target and perp is still male on male. Mm. Interesting. It's because there's so darn many men. So we finally got the picture of the elephant. And I guess we had been grabbing the little tail. We didn't know there was a trunk and a whole big body there mm -hmm. until we did the national studies, but it still is mostly men. Go ahead. Right. Interesting. So why do you think women are highly likely to only target women instead of males? Well, there's there's a book for that too. One is mine. I'm watching. No, it isn't. Um, it's called Woman's Inhumanity to Woman. Why can't I put my hands on it? Doesn't matter. Um, and in that, um, uh, uh, the feminist wrote, hey, there's no sisterhood, ladies. So let's, let's look at it, that women are as cold and calculating and ruthless as men when the circumstances allow. I think... And so she had this whole big thing about maybe it's a leftover remnant of evolution, biological evolution, where um, we've evolved from other animals and um, the females all want to mate with the alpha male in the tribe and so that their progeny will have the best chance of living and surviving and having a good life. So you you mate with that ugly, the ugliest, but the strongest baboon in the uh, troop. All right. And I don't know how much of that is true. I see it more as a response to the, um, the reward structure. And they're just paying attention to the work environment. Women, we know, women in general, pay more attention to the cues in social environments than men. And so they see what gets people ahead, what gets them promoted, what gets them noticed. And if aggression is the, is the key aspect in that workplace culture, you're darn right women are going to do it too. Or why do women target other women? Well, we know there's still a low representation of women in the C-suites in corporate America. And so if they're managers and supervisors in the lower ranks, maybe the people they're more likely to come in contact with, in other words, maybe it's just proximity. 
women are around more women, so that's who they bully. It's sort of like love the one you're with. It's bully the one you're near. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's paying attention to the cues. I don't, mm-hmm. and yet there's this Finnish uh, woman out of Finland, Denise Celine, uh, is a researcher who was long time said bullying is less about gender and it's a gendered phenomenon that mm-hmm. men and women experience it differently. In fact, mm-hmm. I, I compile this 900 article research library. I just updated uh, 896 articles. Um, can I round up to 900? Mm-hmm. Um, and I just included a brand new study that showed that men were the more sensitive to emotional abuse in um, in this particular study than women were, which was which is counterintuitive to a lot of people. And that mm-hmm. they showed the longest uh, lasting impact to being abused, I think because of the shock. Women mm-hmm. maybe is, are more conditioned to the abuse of mistreatment and being discounted and treated as second class and, and that, that armed them better prepared and better. Uh, in the early days, when we did the first studies and it came out with women on women, a woman choosing to bully a woman 80% of the time, they did, t- I mean, we did Today Show segments. I flew to New York and did Today Shows all on the woman on woman. But I said, you're missing the point. It's still men on men. The big lesson here, Fong, is what distinguishes bullying from the illegal forms of sexual harassment are uh, is primarily the gender thing. When it's same gender and same race as it is in 64% of the cases, there's nothing legally uh, out there for that. Uh, mm. And that's why it doesn't... That's what also keeps it way back to one of your first questions mm-hmm. goes along with silent epidemic. It's invisible because it's legal. Mm-hmm. If it's legal, it's invisible. We right. only see it when it's a Me Too caliber story. If right. it's Me Too, that's code for sexual harassment mm-hmm. and bingo. And that's very limited. We've shown in our, na- and we did a national, I did a question in one of the early surveys God, it was a complicated question, but I still use it. And it's been backed up by several academic studies, too. It's really kind of neat. It validates my asking. The pie is mistreatment. Mm -hmm. The slice of the pie is sexual harassment. And it's only one-fifth of the pie. Mm -hmm. So that I can say in one-fifth of bullying cases, in one in five cases, there's some sexual harassment going on. So don't be stupid. Mm-hmm. Tell me, complain about the sexual harassment. Get off the bullying bandwagon because it there it's not going to get you anywhere. Mm-hmm. There there are too few policies against bullying because policies employer policies depend upon the laws. In the mm-hmm. absence of a law, ain't no employer has to do it. Mm-hmm. And now we've run into enlightened employers through the years, but there are darn few. Mm-hmm. So what are common traits that workplace bullies have you know do they have like an abusive childhood childhood you know have they been bullied in the past and now they're you know just kind of exemplifying that trauma to other people are they like more insecure you know what what are some common traits all of the above the we're on to something there are two piles of explanations two categories those about which we can do something Mm-hmm. And those about which we are totally helpless to stop or re- to rejigger, or re-engineer, because these are fully functioning adults, different than the kid bullies, you see, who are still developing human beings, and mm-hmm. we have a chance to veer them in a, toward a path. But these, their brains are set and all the rest. So high on the list of things we could do not a thing about is early, early life experience. And there is a significant evidence that if you were exposed to very cold, negligent parenting in your the first 18 months of your existence, long before you had awareness of anything, 18 months, mm. wow, you're going to be screwed up for a great deal of your life and you're going to have a hole in your soul. You'll be incapable of empathic relationships. You mm. just don't, you just, 
You can watch people subjected to pain and torture. You don't care. Wow. It doesn't move you. Um, you will also, it's called um, reactive attachment disorder, RAD. And if you grow up like, you're going to have an adolescence where you're going to basically learn to be a liar and manipulator. And then in full-blown adulthood, you take those lies and carry it into your adulthood work experience. And we think those are the cruelest that are out there. Mm. In fact, there's going to be a small portion of them who are going to be psychopaths, very small portion. Mm. Um, the psychopath guru, uh, name is Robert Hare, H-A-R-E. And his books have documented, he thought, he thought originally in the uh, early 90s, one in a hundred executives are psychopaths. Then he, he co-authored a book called Snakes and Suits, when psychopaths go to work. And he said, well, maybe it's more than that. Mm -hmm. I have a study by him and his cohort that showed about 25% of supervisors uh, have psychopathic like traits. Wow. To be a psychopath is to be a con man, a con woman. Think mm -hmm. Ted Bundy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Short of murder, what do they do? They rob, they plunder, they steal, they steal other people's identities, they trample the rights of others, uh, they lie, they cheat. Uh, the promiscuous, that's a big thing. That's a big part of it. Um, but that stuff is set up in early life experience. Mm -hmm. There's a much better explanation. Also, though, uh, that doesn't give hope for change. And then I'll talk about a couple change things and then we'll mm -hmm. leave it. But this is what I use in trials too, in, in court cases. Um, it comes out of University of British Columbia. It's called the Dark Triad. Uh, three personality traits that often co-occur in a cluster, if you will, mm -hmm. um, of people who have the researchers called dark personalities. And to me, that they're hyper-aggressive bullies. And the traits are narcissism, me, 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 um, cruelty, the, psychop the psychop psychopathic like or L-I-T-E, light. Um, and the third one is that Machiavellian uh, trait of willing to exploit other people. Mm -hmm. You put those three together, you've got this self-centered, cruel, manipulative, exploit exploitative person. Bingo. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not certifiable, according to the DSM-5. They're not going to like a clinician's not going to come in and say, oh, you have a personality mm -hmm. disorder. Mm -hmm. What these researchers are talking about is there's a significant number of people in the common population, those who walk among us, who have what are called subclinical expression of these traits. So you, you don't have a narcissistic personality disorder, but you're all about yourself. Mm -hmm. You are like egocentric to extreme. You are extremely cruel. You're not a psychopath, but you sure are cruel and you love harming other people. And you have a little tinge of sadism to you where you derive pleasure from inflicting harm. And then the third thing is, yep, you're a user. You use other people, period. And that's how it is. Well, that is also a portrait of a person who climbs to the very top of the corporate ladder too. Mm -hmm. That's what's weird. So wow. there's a high correlation between the dark triad traits and success. And yet these, to me, these are the emotionally um, deficient, uh, developmentally uh, arrested, arrested development, the old show. Um, they're not wholly formed human beings. They're half baked, but they're they're good at what they do, and they're very cruel. and And the corporate world loves that. And so there's that explanation. There's that explanation. Mm -hmm. But you know what, Fong? There's not a damn thing we can do about it. Here's my question, and my I've oh, I've long said this. I think a lot of bullying can be attributed to a cover up. Good people, otherwise good people, not knowing how to do the job, embarrassed they don't know how to do the job, and they use this aggression as bluff and cover. So I wonder how much, if we just had more training on how to manage people, if we if we told them, 
you know, to be a manager, you got to, it's, it's an incredible investment of your time and your soul. And you're going to do a lot of listening, man. It's really hard work. It's not about bossing people around that boss is the worst word. See boss just conjures up TV shows, comedies, movies, goofy depictions and the rest, but it's seriously hard work if you're going to do it well, but we don't do it well and companies don't train. So I don't know how much bullying could be stopped. I think we could control it with a lot more on how to manage and be realistic about it. But right now, if you just tell somebody, hey, you're boss tomorrow, you weren't the before, they go by default, they go into command and control mode because mm -hmm. that's what we that's how we fictionalize it. That's how we portray it in literature. That's how it's on TV. And mm -hmm. then we go and we do that. Hey, the clip I use uh, in our training program, Workplace Bullying University, our premier training program, uh, I, that's what I'm recording right now. I've never recorded it, but I'm going to reach more people than live, is I use a, a Kevin Spacey clip from an old movie called Swimming with Sharks. In a, he's a two-bit movie studio producer. And he says, he's, he just, he's reaming this male assistant on his first day of hire. And he actually delivers a line. I don't mean to be cruel. No one says, I don't mean to be cruel, unless you're cruel. But it's still the best clip ever. Um, because it says, your job is to uh, serve, uh, protect my interest and to serve my needs. Mm -hmm. And that's hmm. the bully's creed. And, and people don't, we don't admit to that. We treat Boston's like it's cute. Right. Okay. So let's say someone's listening to all this. How do people know? What do you mean someone? I hope someone. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, people are many listening someones. to this. Yeah, many you someone's. You mean someone who's listening. being bullied. Right. Yeah. That's what I meant. How do they know that they're being bullied? Like, what are some ways that they could identify that? And then also, what can they do about it? Well, dear bully target, you're the last to know. That's, first mm -hmm. of all, I want you to know that you're the one who doesn't know. You are unaware. Your family knows. Mm -hmm. Your coworkers know. Your friends know. They've seen the change in you the people who are intimate with you, they see the change and out of compassion, they wonder. And they start to connect the dots. Got to be work because things were good at home until this happened. But now things are wrecked at home and you don't spend time with the kids and you're always in bed and you're always exhausted and you skip social life, yada, yada, yada. Why is it you don't connect the dots? Because you don't want to believe that there's a world where these cruel people exist, and you somehow got trapped in it. So I told you about personal shame. The goal of humiliation is to have a sense of undeservedness. You are an undeserving human being. You're worthless, worthlessness. That's the goal of humiliation. And it all too often is successfully planted in the mind of the bully target. So they're distracted from being rational and seeing what's happening to them. They can't see. They're the, they're the frog that's been brought to uh, the boiling point in a pot when the water was merely lukewarm when they got in and they just didn't recognize it. So you're going to have to rely upon other people to tell you that and, and believe it. But once you discover it, once you discover the phrase, I always liked it. I liked in the early days. Well, I stumbled upon your site in the internet. Stumbled. I said, yeah, that's the verb. Stumbled. Because they were probably looking for harassment and the rest. And then they found the bridge. And then they said, ah, this then is what is happening to me. That first step is so critical to externalize your problem. Remember I said self-blame is the natural turn of events that's unhealthy. That's when the health decline begins. That's when the anxiety kicks in. That's when cardiovascular effects start. That's when you start to get um, gastrointestinal effects, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, and other stress-related, a whole host 
of stress-related physical things have begun to happen to you long before you knew what was happening. And you didn't, you, you go to the doctor and the doctor will say, why is your blood pressure, which is the gateway hypertension, why is your blood pressure skyrocketing like 180 over 140? What the hell's going on in your life? What is stressful in your life? And you say, well, things aren't good at work. The doc will always say, quit that job. And, or they'll say in a very condescending way, well, just quit that job. But you then say, but I can't. I got kids in college. I got a mortgage. I got this. I got that. Yada, 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 yada. And you come up with all the reasons you can't. But if you don't get to safety, let me tell you, dear target, your health will continue to decline. And some of the decline will be irreversible. Now, by knowing the nature of stress and the human stress response, most of the harm is reversible if you intervene early enough, if you recognize it. So the earlier the recognition, the better. But we know the average, get this Fong, the average exposure time is 22 months. 22 months, that's darn near two years. Um, so it's not weeks. Mm -hmm. is a long time and most of that is i have to say wasted time because the target is waiting we and we've done all these surveys of targets non-scientific mm -hmm. so i can back it up with data they're waiting on the bully to change they're waiting on hr to do the investigation they're waiting on justice to happen you're going to wait till you die mm -hmm. then the government people i always always fun to make in fun of them they'd say I only have 11 more years to retirement. I said, you're not going to make it to Christmas. And it's already November. Stop it. Mm -hmm. What we got to do, and get this targets, get this in your head clearly. There are two kinds of safety to which you are entitled to, your employer will not tell you about, but you must insist on. First, psychological safety. You need to be free from uh, the risk of ridicule, and humiliation. Um, Google did a big study of their work teams. Uh, probably 10 years ago now, maybe I'm thinking, I don't know. When I say, well, wasn't that long ago, the years have flown by. I guarantee you it's between five and 10 years. But it was written up in the New York Times. Front page stories, a big deal. Um, they had the money to conduct internal research and they brought in scientists and all that. Guess what the number one predictor of what, what they, the question was, how do we um, identify which of our work teams are the best, are the most productive, the most creative, the most innovative? And how do we make our less innovative teams more like them? Bingo, the differentiating factor was psychological safety. Mm. You can't be creative if you're worried at a brainstorming situation and being shot down every time. So mm -hmm. they identified psychological safety as the main precursor, the main predictor of team success. A uh, woman's name is um, Edmondson, mm -hmm. who did that. Mm -hmm. New book called The Fearless Organization. So she's driving out fear. Mm -hmm. uh, the second type of safety that you need to be aware of that you deserve, period, whether you're, and clearly it just has nothing to do with unionization. We have too low of a unionization rate. And hell, unions don't even know about this. They're not as big advocates for health and safety as they need to be. Uh, the second type of safety is called psychosocial safety. I know, big word, but it's as simple as this. Psychosocial safety encompasses, and the whole European Union and Canada and Australia, and they all embrace psychosocial safety. I got a brand new book by a colleague of mine, Ellen Cobb, that summarized in 2022 all the advances in uh, occupational health and safety regulations and laws around the world that we don't have in America regarding psychosocial safety. And it is as follows. It includes traditional work, work conditions, scheduling and hours and number of days at work and uh, Exposure to physical risks, that's fine. Everybody understands exposure to chemical. OSHA understands you know, mm -hmm. like chemical risk, biological risk, physical risk. But what about social risks? 
What about the quality of your social relationships? When you add potential toxicity, negativity, destructiveness of your social relationships to the plethora of work conditions, uh, that's what makes for a toxic workplace. And I don't know if you saw it last November, the U.S. Surgeon General put out a little report saying, hey, we got to start taking care of worker well-being. And what he cited were the five criteria uh, defining uh, attributes of a non-toxic work environment, or actually the five definers criteria for a toxic work environment. And he said, these must be avoided. And, and in there is abuse. And in there is inequality. And in there are a bunch of other things, but they are psychosocial factors. So we need to put the quality of our relationships uh, on the list up there with, here's your MDSD, your, uh, your uh, hazard sheets. You've got too much chlorine in your work environment. And should there be a spill, you got to put a mask on, you got to do this, you got to do that. Well, what about when you run into a toxic work environment because of destructive interpersonal relationships, aka bullying? Bingo. So you are entitled to those two. Now, once you get that entitlement in your head, then you know that you're not asking for anything extraordinary. And so you need to demand safety. They're not, don't demand that they're gonna that they're gonna fire the boss, the bully. They're not gonna do it. They they circle the wagons and defend them. Just think Harvey Weinstein. Think of what we've learned from the Me Too movement and how these powerful people are protected by their employers. Okay, so we accept that. I don't accept it. I mean, I don't, um, whatever. It's just a reality. We have to constantly fight that. But that's not the battle a bully target can do. A bully target is not responsible for cleaning up his or her environment. They didn't ask for this. They didn't invite it. And they didn't deserve the mistreatment. So having said that, you're also not the one to get yourself out of this mess. The employer put you in harm's way. They allowed you to be abused with no accountability for the perpetrator. They and only they can fix it. But what, and so now we arrive at a very sad statistic. Once you are targeted, you have a 60, well, you have a two out of three chance of losing that job you love for no reason of your own. Because the only resolute, what makes the bullying stop, as I ask in the surveys, target gets fired, target is driven out, constructive discharge, that's called, or target quits because they finally realize that their health is more important than the paycheck. Now, those are all hard, harsh outcomes, but that is the reality. And I've I've asked targets that themselves, and I've got it from the public and the national studies. So that's how it really happens. What stops the bullying is you're probably going to be separated from that job you love. And all you ever did was say, I just want to be left alone to do my job. So, and then if you want to stay and fight back, okay, if you want to file a lawsuit and try that, don't do it while you're working there. Mm -hmm. And don't count on the court system to deliver the justice that you see, because the courts aren't about justice. They're only about money. And if you can't get the money, you know, don't don't go that route. It's not worth the all the pain uh, and all of the rest. But, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so go talk to a lawyer. But I'm here for I'm, is it a very, I'm very close to a lawyer and lawyers, and I can see the pain inflicted on targets. Um, why don't you just get your coworkers to stand up on your behalf? There's the social psychology defeating you. People are petrified for their own necks. They're scared. They're fearful uh, that they'll be next. And mm. standing up for you will bring them harm. We're cowards. We're just full of cowardice. Mm. Our organizations are, are, are not courageous. Um, uh, a former academic just left the University of Oregon recently and started the Center for um, Institutional Courage. Uh, mm -hmm. I love that name and I love that thing. She talks about um, how uh, Jennifer Freed, and I I'm with her on that. I think they lack courage. 
And but I'm really here to say your coworkers are not going to be your friends. They will betray you and turn on you. And you'll lose their friendship too once you're separated. Sad, but you know what? It's their loss. You were the better person. But you need to make the priority your safety and your health. And until you learn to do that, you will stay in an abusive relationship. It's now you're very much like a battered spouse, rationalizing why you stay and why you can't get out and why you don't deserve to get out. And so it's a major mind shift on perspective. No, I do deserve safety. And yes, I deserve to work without harm. And I don't need to be injured. Psychosocial safety risk is the risk of emotional injury from emotional abuse. So you don't need that either. You don't need the ridicule of the loss of psychological safety and that the and the uh, loss of psychosocial safety is the true injury that again, I'm telling you the science documents, the stress-related physical diseases that will kill you. Stress doesn't kill, it's the diseases that'll kill you. Cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, immunological, cancer, all of that, autoimmune, sleep disorders, the list goes on. I teach all this stuff in the class. And then you got the psychological that's also in the brain. You see, with a stressed brain, you're not capable of rational decision-making. So that's why you're not at your peak power at that time. And when you're under duress, you need to get home, you need to get whole, you need to get healthy. So go out on disability leave short term first and then apply for long term it'll probably be denied but you'll have at least 90 days to figure out the value listen to your friends and family they will tell you what your life is worth they know who you were before this happened you can recover that person you can reclaim your dignity and then and come back in a powerful way and start making demands and if that employer won't make you safe then you can't be there can't stay mm-hmm. there that's that's the short and long of it it's it's a it's a tough road but we've seen people recover on the other side and they kick themselves ah oh, why did I wait so long why did I wait mm-hmm. so long and i'm here to tell you your health connect the dots what has happened your mistreatment is leading to your health decline and pay attention to your health and save your life not just a paycheck Wow, this was such a powerful conversation, Gary. I really appreciate you hopping on and sharing your knowledge with people. And my biggest takeaway is, you know, if we have better leadership, leadership development, you know, this would solve a lot of the problems. And so I think that's something that we need to focus on. You know, we talk, we hear leadership for a while now, but it's still lacking. Just a word thrown around. Yeah. We can't wait on everyone to have personally experienced it. Mm -hmm. The CEOs who have called us in over the years personally experienced it. And so you're darn right, they wanted to get rid of it. But the rest of them, in the absence of personal experience, they said, I don't know what you're talking about. I I don't see that. And Mm -hmm. we know from our national survey about over a third of Americans say, what are you talking about? But 30% say, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So you have those two polar groups, deniers and the ones with the personal experience. And they're just not talking the same language. Mm -hmm. You know, the other thing I want to say to you, young man, is my hope is that enough generations are coming up now, cohort groups that have been subjected to the no bullying message in schools. Mm-hmm. They're hitting the workplace. They are saying, I'm not taking that crap. Mm-hmm. I'm out of here. And if they have any kind of tech background, they can just walk. And that's the beauty. And employers are saying, where are they going? Because mm-hmm. they don't need to take your crap, old man. Right. It's my old man generation. Mm-hmm. Old folks were the worst and we stayed the longest and we were the stupidest. But with each younger generation, they're more in touch with the anti-bullying message where you don't, you have an entitlement mm-hmm. to a bully-free life. And I love that. I just love it. Now, I will be dying off. We'll all be dying off. 
but you shouldn't have to wait on every all the prior generations to die off till they get it. You got to get into, and here's your point. You got to get into leadership. You got to get into positions of control and say, mm. "Now we're going to run this." No, no. Mm. Fundamental right. You have inherent dignity. You don't have to earn it, and you don't need to risk any injury. Cut the crap. Those games are over. Are we here to make money? Are we here to make these widgets? Are we here to make a movie? Are we here to do this or that? Your personal agenda that you have not worked out because you're a defective adult human being because of your screwed up infancy, for God's sakes, let alone mm -hmm. childhood and adolescence. And the, no, no, and no and no. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can grow an intolerance for that, that's generationally driven, I'm hopeful. That's my hope. Not for people, not for the older generations to come around and see the wisdom, but to be pushed by the young ones and say, if you want my labor, if you want my brain power, of course, now they think it's all going to be AI driven. Yeah, AI on the road to extinction. Mm -hmm. So species, so be careful what you ask for. Do not replace everyone younger. You still need humans. We're going to need humans. Come on, we need each other. And bullying only happens when we deny our humanity. Mm. That's for sure. And I'm counting on I'm counting on the younger generations. Please, please, please whip us into shape and demand that this stop. That gives me hope. What a great way to end, Gary. Um, where can people find you? Workplacebullying.org. All, all, all things flow from there. I've got a voluminous set of free videos on our YouTube channel you can access from there. I got free tutorials, our books, we got our books. We're just trying to lay it out there for people to, to more quickly recognize what's happening so they can short circuit the health harm. Awesome. All right, everybody, thank you so much for listening and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye for now. Thanks, Paul.